This series is all about universes, multiverses, planets, worlds, continents and cities. We're delving not into specific games, but into the milieus created for them. We'll be looking at where these settings came from, their major features and why you should consider them for your own gaming experiences. During the decade of 2nd edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, TSR presented many different campaign settings. Old stalwarts were updated, Greyhawk, Dragonlance, the Forgotten Realms and so on. Old concepts were expanded and reimagined, as in Planescape. Some were new, but very much in a similar vein to the core worlds of Dungeons and Dragons. A handful introduced settings the like of which the D&D game had never seen before. We've already covered one of these in this series, in the shape of Spelljammer. In this, episode 8, we'll be covering another the harsh, scorched world of magic-wrought disaster that is Athas and the Dark Sun campaign setting. There is no doubt that the role-playing game hobby grew out of the wargaming hobby, and these two hobbies remain related to this day. Indeed, quite often they coincide, with companies producing war games tied into their role-playing game settings, or vice versa. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, impetus for bringing the two hobbies together was pronounced, largely due to the success of Warhammer Fantasy Battles and Warhammer Fantasy Role-Playing. Games Workshop had created a model that worked, a war game, role-playing game and miniatures line that all supported each other and drove each line's sales. It was something that other companies within the field could not ignore. In 1985, TSR produced a war game that was tied to its advanced Dungeons and Dragons line, Battle System. This game got some support in the H series of modules, the Bloodstone Pass series, and a set of 15mm miniatures. With the advent of 2nd edition, Battle System got an overhaul, and a second version of the game was released in 1989, followed by a skirmish level variant in 1991. The official miniatures continued to be released at 15mm scale, but these new rules encouraged 25mm and up, essentially reflecting what had become the norm for games such as Warhammer and Iron Crown's Bladestorm the latter being another role-playing game company's attempt, this time Iron Crown, in releasing a war game to couple with their role-playing output. In this instant, Bladestorm was given a setting within one of Shadow World's continents. Battle System was given some support and a handful of supplements, mainly for the Forgotten Realms, but TSR decided that they wanted a world of war to specifically tie to the game, a world in which Battle System could live as a focus alongside the advanced Dungeons & Dragons game, rather than as a bolt-on to an established setting such as the Forgotten Realms. To that end, a team of designers envisioned a Mad Max-esque post-apocalyptic setting with scattered warring factions. This made some design sense. Each faction could have a specific and isolated home base, with the post-apocalyptic backdrop of dwindling resources providing impetus for these factions to fight, and the entirety of the intervening world acting as a potential battlefield. The original vision was to depart from the D&D standards, but it soon became clear that making it too different would lose some of the potential market. So, elements of traditional D&D were built in, alongside more alien concepts. No horses here, my equine lovers, and parallels draw to the core classes of the game. Eventually, what emerged from this pool of designers in 1991 was the burned world of Athas, the setting for the Dark Sun campaign. The original core box set contained gorgeously rendered maps, all in a style that reflected the setting itself. Two books, one providing background material for this new world under the guise of the Wanderer's Journal, and one providing new and altered rules for use alongside the core AD&D set, and a starter scenario, with some fiction. Evocative artwork was provided by Gerald Brom, who formed part of the design team, and Thomas Baxter, both of whom brought the setting to life from the page. For me, it remains one of the most beautifully imagined Dungeons & Dragons sets published. What the game didn't contain was anything relating to battle system. In fact, only the adventure Road to Uruk tied into the war game, having a mass battle as part of the scenario's plot. 
With poor sales of the second edition of Battle System came the divorcing of Dark Sun from it. Athas was now not a war world, but a world of default Dungeons and Dragons play, that is, plotting the rise of a small band on their journey to becoming heroes, albeit within a setting otherwise alien to any D&D setting previously seen. One other obscure element of D&D the Dark Sun setting was also designed to tie into was Psionics. Never really well thought out, Psionics had gone through somewhat of a renaissance in 2nd edition via the complete Psionics handbook. This book presented a psionic system that made sense within the D&D framework, but psionics had been removed from the core rules for the second edition of Advanced D&D. Creatures that traditionally drew upon psionic powers, therefore, had those powers modelled as special abilities in the Monstrous Compendium, with them being reinstated as psionics as an option within the complete psionics handbook. In order to tie into the, the psionics rules, the Dark Sun campaign made one big assumption – Everyone is psionic, even some monsters. All characters got a psionic power, and psionicists, that is, the class that specialises in the development of psionics, were built into Dark Sun as a core character type. In many ways, this made psionics fulfil the wizard role within Dark Sun parties. You see, a great disaster to befall the world and lead it to this post-apocalyptic state of being was, basically, the overuse and abuse of magical spells, Magic, the setting postulates, draws energy from living things in order to power spell effects. Two types of wizard walk the world. Preservers, who learn how to control the energy that they tap into, so as they take only just enough to produce the effect they need, not so much as the land around them cannot recover from the loss. Defilers, on the other hand, don't care for the land around them. They power their spells with whatever life energy they can and leave a trail of barren waste in their wake. It is these arcane ecological abuse that has created the vast deserts that comprise much of Athas's land. Conflict within Athas is manifold. Civilization is concentrated into walled city-states ruled by powerful sorcerer kings. They muster their forces against each other where they are able. Against the rule of the Sorcerer Kings is the mysterious Veiled Society, an organisation dedicated to bringing an end to Sorcerer King rule, and the practice of defining magic as a whole. Various tribes inhabit the wilderness areas between the city-states that prey upon anyone they can for the things they need to survive. Many of these tribes are of non-human race, and many are mixed groupings of slaves that have somehow gained freedom. Ah... Yes, slavery. Slavery is a big thing in Dark Sun. The default starting scenario begins with the characters as slaves, who gain their freedom and go adventuring. One of the first series of novels set in the Dark Sun world, The Prism Pentad, and the first adventure published for the setting that ties into those novels, deals heavily on protagonist slaves attaining freedom and going on to achieve great things. Between 1991 and 1995, ten adventures were published in two campaigns and one standalone piece. The first campaign begins with DS1, Freedom, and then moves through DSQ1, Road to Uric, DSQ2, Arcane Shadows, DSQ3, Asticlian Gambit, and culminates with DSE1, Dragon's Crown. This campaign roughly follows the events of the Prison Pentad novels, the second campaign begins with DSM-1, Black Flames, and runs through DSM-2, Merchant House of Amketch, DSM-3, Marauders of Nibane, and DSE-2, Black Spine. This campaign is much looser, and each of its adventures are largely standalone. The adventure Forest Maker stands apart from these two campaigns. With the exception of this and the two DSE-coded adventures, the Dark Sun adventures tried something different, each adventure came in a package that included two spiral-bound flipbooks, one for the players and one for the DM. The books were designed to fold out and stand up. The DM's book included the narrative of the adventure, statistics and so on. The player's book included maps, diagrams, illustration and other odds and sods intended to bring the scenario to life. As the DM flipped through the encounters in his book, at various points he would give instructions to get the players to flip their book on. It was a novel idea, and worked reasonably well. However, the novelty eventually wore off, and later adventures were released in a standard form. 
Source books released during this period covered monsters in two volumes of Monsters Compendium Sheets, reference works, DSR-1 Slave Tribes, DSR-2 June Trader, DSR-3 Veiled Alliance, and DSR-4 Valley of Dust and Fire. Sourcebooks DSS, City State of Tear, the focus of the first campaign, DSS2, Earth, Air, Fire and Water, on Athas's elemental clerics, and DSS3, Elves of Athas. The Will and the Way and the Complete Gladiator's Handbook expanded on Athasian psionics and the Gladiator class from the campaign box set, and Thrykreen of Athas expanded out the insectoid race that, along with half-giants and the sterile half-dwarf mull, were one of the additional player character races of the setting, alongside humans, dwarves, elves and halflings. Beyond the Prism Pentad was released in 1995, uh, which brought things up to date with the events described in the Dark Sun novels. For the world was presented as an evolving one. This, then, was tied into a revision of the campaign setting box, with a much-expanded Wanderer's Journal, now including details of Athas's past history, that were skimpy at best in the original set. A rulebook, a separate psionics rulebook, in recognition that the complete psionics handbook was no longer directly available, and a glorious map printed on fabric. It did come with paper maps, too. Only three supplements were released for this revision. Wind Riders of the Jagged Cliffs, Defilers and Preservers, and Psionic Artifacts of Athas. A couple of additional releases to mention before we move on. In 1992, the Mysteries of the Athasian Dragons was revealed in all of its glory in the Dragon King's hardback rulebook, including the heady mixture of psionics and spells into powerful effects, and the Ivory Triangle box set, which detailed the city-states of Nibane and Gulg that lie at opposite ends of one of the sparse regions of vegetation. After that 1995 box set release, the world of Athas was retired as a product line for a time being, although some support still popped up in the TSR periodicals. It was not itself revived as part of Dungeons & Dragons 3rd edition during the early to mid-2000s, although there was support from the Athas.org website, Continuing to this day, Athos.org provides a number of resources for the Dark Sun setting, including 3rd edition rules. In 2010, Athos was revisited by Wizards of the Coast for 4th edition, producing a hardback campaign setting core book, a creature catalogue and a handful of adventures, Marauders of the Dune Sea and Lost Cistern of Aravac released as books, the latter as part of Game Day. Blood Sand Arena was released as part of Free RPG Day, and Fury of the Waste Walker was released as part of the D&D Encounters program. The 4th edition version returned the setting back to its origins prior to the Prism Pentad, and to the time frame of the original 2nd edition box set. It made some alterations to the setting too, some unnecessary in my opinion, and some actually worthwhile. Rather than present rules alterations to the core to represent the differences between Athas and other D&D worlds, as had 2nd edition, the 4th edition iteration elected to keep as much of the D&D core intact as possible. Rather than new classes, such as the Templar from 2nd edition, this version drew correlations between core classes and Athasian equivalents. Templars, for example, became warlocks. Some of the more esoteric races were removed from the Dark Sun core, while some of the core D&D races were added. Given the nature of Athasian dragons and the locked-away concept of the world as far as the D&D multiverse went, the additions of Eladrin, Tieflings and Dragonborn to the setting felt jarring. But that was OK. The locked-away concept was discarded here anyway. Other changes included defining magic being a spellcasting option rather than having defilers as a specific class, and psionics became defined as powers, similar to spells, instead of a mechanic in their own. Roles previously covered by classes such as gladiators and psionicists became themes here, in some ways similar to second edition kits. Themes provided dark sun colour to the generic core classes, and in this regard, they did their job very well. The 4th edition iteration, through the differences in rules between 2nd and 4th, uh, from the tweaks made to the setting to slot it in better to the 4th edition framework, felt different. But the essentials of the setting were there, and it was a welcome, if brief, return to the burnt world.
Other than Athas.org, which continues to support the setting that was the last hurrah for Dark Sun to date. Some articles have commented that Wizards of the Coast's view of the world's themes as problematic, perhaps with the widespread depiction of slavery, or perhaps it's the cannibalistic halflings. Whatever the reasoning, Dark Sun remains one of the standout worlds released for Dungeons & Dragons, primarily because it dared to be different and proved that D&D has a larger scope than its traditional pseudo-medieval fare. The broad theme of the Dark Sun setting is survival. The world is harsh, the environment, its political makeup, and the social structures within it and beyond the various city-states. There are several other themes running through the setting. The corruption of power, as displayed by the Dragon Kings. Commentary on ecological disaster, as exemplified by the effect that defining magic has on the environment. Factors in which the inhabitants of Athas made their own world into the harsh desert, as portrayed in the setting source material. And the delicacy of freedom, how easily it is lost, and how hard it is to fight to regain it, as shown by the prevalence of slavery amongst the city-states. The standard races of D&D game are all there, humans, elves, halflings and dwarves, along with some specific to Athas, half-giants, Terrans and Thrykreen, for example. The core races are not quite as described in the core. Elves are tribal bandits rather than fey forest dwellers, and halflings are nasty little jungle dwellers rather than the plump gardeners and thieves. There's very little of the generic fantasy within the setting. Characters themselves are shaped by the environment and tend to be hardier than their equivalent on other worlds, higher than average ability scores, and our higher suggested starting level being two ways that this is achieved. There's also the prevalence of psionics. This adds another dimension to characters and their enemies alike. What on other worlds would be a mundane encounter with bandits takes on another dimension when those bandits wield wild psionic powers. Mammalian life forms are rare, the roles of horses and other riding and draft animals being taken up by insectoid creatures across the desert. Metal, any metal, is also a rarity, and so the weapons and armour used by characters is more likely to be fashioned from obsidian and chitin and stone and wood. Even the coinage the setting uses is of ceramic form. If you're looking for something different and off the beaten track of the usual fantasy tropes and pseudo-historical modelling, Dark Sun could fit that mould. There is nothing within it that smacks of traditional Dungeons & Dragons. It is brutal, violent, survivalist fun amid a backdrop of powerful tyrants and savage wastelands. The setting is very well named. If June... Conan and Mad Max had a twisted sorceress love child, Dark Sun would be it. If that sounds like fun, and you're looking for a violent change of pace from traditional D&D, then it is absolutely for you. Of all the official Dungeons & Dragons settings, it is the most different in nature and the furthest from the core concepts of the game. It's wild, and it is wonderful. <laughs>